Welcome to Pod of Jake, a podcast hosted by Jake. You can go to zerofjake.com to learn more about Jake and everything that he does. And feel free to email him anytime at jake at blogofjake.com or message him at zerofjake on Twitter or at jake on Warpcast. Anyway, we thank you for listening and we hope you enjoy this episode. If you do, please consider giving Pod of Jake a five star review on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. We appreciate your support. Thank you, RAC, for uh, joining me on the podcast today. I really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, I've been looking forward to this conversation for a while, and you've sort of been on my radar, you know, being a, a lover of music and pretty into crypto for several years. I've always seen you sort of like operating at the cutting edge, and now I know you've got a new company and uh, a new app, and so it's it's a great time, I think, for us to uh, be able to connect, and, and I'm really looking forward to the conversation. I think the best place to start, um, for those who don't know you, would be just to kind of tell your story uh, from as early as you're willing to start to where you are today and uh, maybe you can kind of talk about some of the decisions you made along the way. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for having me. I'm, I'm stuck to be here. Uh, it is interesting being, you know, kind of, let's call it like maybe an early adopter or something that at the time people were so dismissive of it. They were just like, okay, whatever. It's just that weird crypto thing, you know? And then, you know, a couple of years later, 2021, like everybody thinks you're like this genius, <laughs> but like, you know, there's all these people, that you know we're just kind of like very apathetic about the whole thing or you know uh ar around that time um but to maybe just back up and give some broader context of like who i am and how i got to where i am um on a on a cold winter night no it's a <laughs> but i uh I, I was actually uh, born and raised in in portugal um it's where i spent um most of my early life i uh my I'm a dual citizen, so I'm a, I'm a U.S. citizen and a Portuguese citizen. So my mom's American, and I actually grew up, you know, bilingual, going to like public school in Portugal, but I also uh, grew up speaking English at home. So that's so I've always been kind of in between multiple uh, worlds, like 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 that. Uh, but you know, I I very early on I sort of got into computers and and I think like, you know, they kind of go hand in hand with music, you know, especially music production. It just, um, you know, it, it, it feels like a, like a natural path to, to like spending more time fiddling with a computer when you're used to like trying to manipulate sound or, you know, pl play with music production. So from a very young age, I, I learned how to build computers and, and playing around with you know, Linux and all these different operating systems. And, and it, it was just kind of like a nerdy obsession of mine. Um, uh, as you can see, nothing has changed too <laughs> much, but, uh, so my, my point more is that I, I had, I've had an interest in technology from a very young age and it was as somebody that was like in Portugal and relatively rural Portugal, it was, especially when the internet came around, I mean, it was sort of my window into the world, you know, um, I, I often say this, but like, I, I basically discovered the Beatles on Napster, you know, it wasn't <laughs> like, it wasn't through other forms of media. The internet was my window in, into the world. So like, I, I was just very interested in it from, you know, the very early, like late nineties, you know, I was just like obsessed with it. I would, uh, back in the dial up days, I would just like, you know, <laughs> uh, use all of all of our like phone credits or whatever however the system worked back in the day but you know I, I would i would get so many minutes racked up on on uh on like our local you know dial-up connection um so okay so like you know fast forward obviously throughout this period i'm learning music i'm i'm, I'm obsessed with it as well and it's just it, it was it became like very quickly like a passion of mine like sort of a, a mix of like a technical side and and like a emotional creative side and music so i had to kind of both covered was were, very you, interesting. Can oh, yeah, I ask, yeah. were you into music before you were into the internet or did the internet sort of open music to you uh it's kind of hard to say which came first i think like i've always played music growing up um i had piano lessons very young you know my parents kind of 
put that on me. I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't super interested in it like right away, but you know, basically once I discovered Nirvana and my friends started to show me how to play, you know, certain songs or whatever, I, I became like pretty into it. Right. Uh, even if I didn't necessarily see it as a career or whatever at the time, I just kind of like, it was, it was an interest of mine. So, um, so, you know, I, I, uh, eventually, so I'm, I'm kind of jumping ahead here substantially, but basically like in fast forward to, uh, like 2005, I start doing, um, I find, I found myself in this like weird niche of like doing remixes because I, I don't really particularly have like a, a, a singing voice. So I always, but I love the music production side of things. So I, I got really into remixing because I already had a vocal provided and all I had to do is basically recreate a song underneath like a vocal that already existed. So it's kind of a counterintuitive way to work on music, but that's actually how a lot of stuff is done where there's sort of a very rough demo and then people kind of rewrite it essentially. Mm -hmm. So, so like a skill that I developed very early on and, um, I was just like hungry for it. And I, uh, in 2005, I, I, I reached out to this little band called Block Party <laughs> and uh, they um, let me do a remix. And, and you know, it was like a whole thing at the time. It, was, it came out on Vice Records of all of all places. Um, but a- anyway, so that was kind of like the beginning of like, oh, OK, like maybe I have a I have a shot here at the music industry. You know, let, let me let me take that. Uh, so. From there, I, I, you know, it was, it was, I was in Portugal. It was hard to like sort of turn that into something like more meaningful. And, you know, I, I think I got a little pressure from my parents to go to school, get a degree and whatnot. So I, I decided to move to the U.S., which, again, I have citizenship. So it was like relatively easy. It wasn't like a, you know, I, I, I kind of feel for some of my friends, which have like, you know, deal with immigration and like all that. It's like it's kind of tough. Right. So I kind of benefited from that and, and went to a school in uh, southern Illinois um where they had kind of a music program and it was just my ticket kind of out of portugal basically so i let's see i I made it there um and then just like quickly got immersed in like the music scene on on campus and had a few bands and you know got got some real world experience even touring in the midwest and just like you know sleeping at walmart parking lots and all that kind of stuff and um, I think I was just like, uh, I, I was really hungry for it. I think I, I, I couldn't imagine working like a normal job. So I, I knew that I had to make music work in some capacity or at least give it like an honest shot. Um, but honestly, my highest aspiration uh, for when I actually started RAC, which was in 2007, was to start a company, actually. Um, I wasn't thinking of it as like an artist project per se. I was thinking of it more like a service, basically like a remix service for labels and you know, it'd be like, okay, you have a new single, um, you know, pay me X amount and I'll do a remix for you f- for promo basically, mm-hmm. you know? And th- it was, it was like somewhat common around then, but like, you know, I don't think anybody had really done it like intentionally as like a business, like, okay, this is, this is my thing. It was always sort of an extra thing that another artist would do. It's like, oh, it's my friend. I'm going to remix their song, whatever. It was always like some version of that. And and truthfully, like I was, I was inspired by some other remixers, namely this guy called uh, Cornelius. I actually have a tattoo of his <laughs> nice. of his first album on, on me. I uh, this Japanese artist Cornelius. He's he put out these like remix records that were not dance music at all. They were just like acoustic, like very soft, very like mellow, um, beautiful music, honestly. And so they would take like a pop song and then turn it into this other thing. And I, I was like so kind of inspired by that, which led me to really kind of focus on the on the on the remix stuff early on because it was it was uh it was such like a great way of um should I put it like like sort of being able to work with like a variety of people while also getting paid and it was uh you know I was sort of starting to build a fan base for this thing this is all kind of I didn't really realize it at the time. But I was like starting to build an audience for myself based off of other people's work in a way and right. uh, or sort of of my reinterpretation of something. Um, all the while, you know, I was in bands and whatever, and we were trying to make that work and that was just not working. And like RAC is like the one thing that kind of stuck. Um, it, originally, it was it was uh, I call it, so RAC stands for Remix Artist Collective. Um, that was like the original idea. And, you know, we would 
the, the idea was like a company, multiple remixers. We do it's a service basically, but very quickly, almost everybody uh, was was always asking for either me or like they they really wanted. Um, you know, I, I kept trying to push like other very talented, very creative people, but something about like my aesthetic or whatever that people latched onto. And and it's after so many, so much failure in music, I felt like I, I, I should, I should lean into this because this is working, you know? Um, so, you know, fast forward many, many years, it, it eventually morphs more into, uh, like a, basically a solo project and where I, you know, especially once I started putting out original work, I, I basically kind of turned it into a solo project. Right. And, um, and it was, uh, I mean, there's a lot there to unpack, <laughs> but to get to, you know, let's say late 2016, I had already been on a major label. I had already left a major label. I was doing stuff independently. I had just signed to Ninja Tune, a great record label, but smaller. I had, I had won a Grammy. I had, I had toured the world. I had done a lot of stuff, you know, and I think like I got to, uh, this point, like in late 2016, where I was kind of coming down from it all, you know, it was like this, like very intense, like 10 years, basically. Um, and I think I just, uh, I was looking for something that was, that was still within my realm of interest, you know, uh, but yeah, something else to kind of focus on and take maybe some, some of the stuff that I learned, you know, I was very opinionated on the music business side of things. So I'm like, maybe there's something here, you know, um, maybe next, to take the pressure off. So I'm not touring constantly. Sorry. Like, like a next chapter basically. Yeah. 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 I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm always going to make music, you know, always going to do that. That's not even in question, but it's, it was, yeah, I was looking for like a change of pace. You know, I think like I, I was touring a lot. I was going, you know, I was every weekend flying three, four times, you know? So it, it, it was a lot. So I was like kind of looking, um, looking for a way out of that and, well, and even even like within you know music obviously there's a bunch of different directions you can go you can be you know making the music you can be doing remixes you can be mm -hmm. on the business side of things and like it sounds like when you were starting really the reason you went down this remix path was because it was what was working uh, mm -hmm. obviously you enjoyed it to start it in the first place and you talked about like the Japanese artist you were inspired by Cornelius I think his name was mm -hmm. um, and you know all this stuff but like had the band taken off and the remixes weren't really well received, you probably just would have gone off with the band, you know? So it's like, you yeah, love yeah, the music, yeah. you love the creation. And so now it makes sense. Like 10 years have passed. You sort of did a lot of what you wanted to do for a long time in this one sort of specific path within music. And then it's like, all right, like what's next? Yeah. 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 And, and like, I, I've, I tried to build RAC in a way where it was like a creative outlet. So it could be a lot of different things to, yeah, again, like offer more flexibility. I think I, I've, I've never done one thing for too long. You know, like I, I did, I did a lot of remixes early on and I, I really <laughs> grinded there. You know, I think I have, I think, I think it's safe to say that I've probably done the most remixes out of anybody. I think I've, I've definitely have that, um, uh, don't quote me on this, but I'm pretty uh -huh. sure that's true. Okay. Uh, so, so like, like I, I've just like focused on that. So for, for a long period of time and now, you know, I'll do maybe one or two remixes a year, maybe <laughs> like, it's not, it's not a huge part of like what I do anymore. Um, but I'm very grateful for its, its role. And, and, you know, then I, I did a, a live touring as like a DJ. Then I did live touring as, as a band and I did, you know, it all kind of came full circle and I did all of these things. So, Again, like late 2016, I stumble on this video of Vitalik Buterin talking about Ethereum. And it was kind of, you know, which, by the way, I just met him just recently. It was kind of funny. Nice. Uh, uh, he's a very, very strange person. <laughs> and I mean that in the best way. I, I really yeah. do. I, I um, love Vitalik. He's been on the podcast a couple of times. He's actually yeah. like the fourth I think the fourth guest ever and it was just yeah. crazy that he was willing to go and give this like brand new nobody podcaster a chance but he did and <laughs> obviously i guess had a, a good enough time that he was willing to come back a few years later so um, that's amazing we've had a few good conversations you know either you know those two podcast recordings and then a couple you know messaging back and forth over the years but it just seems like a great dude and a very interesting different you know you said strange like i think you know strange kind of has like a 
a little bit of a negative connotation or whatever. Yeah, I but, really don't mean oh, it like, in a negative. No, it's just, I, I know. Yeah, yeah, he's, I, I, but I, I feel like if you've met him, you, you understand what I'm saying. Like, he's, he's very, yeah, he's very yeah. different. I think different's like yeah. more sort of like a neutral word, and especially yeah. and particularly as like a leader. Um, mm -hmm. Usually, he's just a very different type of leader. He sort of embraces nuance and like the middle ground on things. And as Ethereum emerges as this huge decentralized thing, it's just been very interesting to see how he's sort of handled that leadership role and he's like you know 30 years old or whatever it's crazy mm -hmm. yeah yeah no it's 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 what i can't imagine having that weight um because for for better or worse people look look to him for his you know opinion on things even though you know uh, i think sometimes that's a, a criticism of ethereum is that you know there's like this i don't think of him as a central figure but you know as a creator inevitably he is you know? right so like people look to that as like a like you know as a, as a loaded position perhaps but i i think he like to your point i think he's handled it very well um and but uh so so anyway so like i stumbled on this video of him a very long time ago. i must have been like devcon 1 or some video and you know i i was i was definitely aware of bitcoin um i i draw this parallel with bitcoin from bittorrent because BitTorrent was the first time where I realized it was the first thing that really um, wasn't able to be shut down by the incumbent music industry. So it was interesting because of like, oh, there it, we can defeat these institutions, um, you know, with with code, with technology. You know what I mean? Like there is a path here, uh, even though BitTorrent was obviously used for piracy. And like it's I don't mean to make that comparison as like sort of uh, as like this like ultimately positive thing, right. you know, I think it served its purpose in forcing an industry to adapt and to move into like, uh, like the streaming era. But unfortunately the streaming era has brought in a whole of, a bunch of other issues, but you know, this core principle of decentralization, I saw stood up and battle tested against like a very powerful industry. So I, I felt like there was something to that. So I was always aware of, of Bitcoin, but I wasn't like really into finance, you know, it wasn't like, this thing that was I was super into. So I kind of glossed over it for a few years. And then in like 2016, I was like, ah, maybe it's time to buy some, you know, just like throw some money at it, see what happens. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, you know, that's where I started to become, you know, go down the rabbit hole as everybody does, you know, it's just like it's like, oh, what's Ethereum? Okay, like what's this? What's this? This is not. And then you kind of uh I had this light bulb moment with specifically with the talk the Vitalik's talk where, you know, talking about general purpose blockchains where, you know, uh, Bitcoin is obviously focused on, you know, currency. That's, that's their thing. But where, you know, with Ethereum, you could, uh, uh, in theory, build anything you want. So for me, the original idea was like, oh my God, we can recreate the music industry on chain, you know, and we didn't use the term on chain right. at the time, but on Ethereum, but, but that's what that's what uh, drew me to it. I was like, oh, we can replace these institutions with code. You know, there's like a very powerful element here that we could really make make a change and make a difference, you know. Um, very naive to like the technical limitations and the speed. And you know what I mean? Like it wasn't like, and, you know, everybody's always like, like it's, it's about the assets. It's about the, you know, the payment rails and whatever, but I, I, for me, I was actually far more interested in the, in the data side of things because it's right now it's just this chaotic mess of very siloed data. Nobody speaks to each other. Nobody communicates with each other. It's very fragmented, you know, and the rights ownership. It's like there's no central kind of place to really know who wrote what, and it's kind of it's this, there's this like very uh, annoying like dispute process and you know um even like spotify for example there's no uh authentication so mm -hmm. it's, it's like a very big problem like you can i mean maybe some of the bigger artists they they watch it more closely but it it, it happens pretty frequently where you get some random person that uploads a song under your artist name and then it goes out to all your followers you know mm -hmm. just an example of like how the the music industry as it's built is not really built for the internet you know right. <laughs> uh yeah it sounds like it might have been somewhat of like a i mean I, I have no idea but it sounds like at least it could have been sort of a uh you know 
almost like a panic reaction to the illegal yes. stuff going on that they needed a quick solution. And this was like sort of the duct tape version and like not to take anything away from these companies that have like made, you know, really strong UXs and stuff. Like, you know, I use all these different platforms to listen to music all the time, but it's not ideal. It wasn't like maybe as well thought out as it could have been. And even if you give them the benefit of the doubt that they did like the best possible versions that they could have done with the technology at the times that they did them, we have new mm -hmm. technology now and maybe yeah. it can be better. And and yeah, to 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 the credit of these platforms, I mean specifically Spotify. I use Spotify all the time. Uh, I may not like their royalty rate, and I have my own <laughs> qualms with that. But uh, and I think they're valid qualms, to be fair. But like, if Spotify got us out of the the one dollar MP3 era, you know what I mean? Which even that was a band aid, you know. Mm. Um, so it's it it you know I <laughs> there's a there's a bit of history there. Spotify was basically like elevated by the incumbent industry and and SoundCloud, which was the independent side of thing, got pushed down and sued mm -hmm. into oblivion. Um, I don't Can I ask actually yeah. uh, a question? Um, you mentioned like your your very first like sort of permissioned remix with I think it was with Block Party that yeah, yeah. you had sort of like reached out to them. Um, I've always sort of, you know, I never really understood like remixes the oh, yeah. permissioned versus permissionless element and obviously we're talking about crypto here so like it's all in on like sort of being permissionless like sort of by default mm -hmm. um but is the like my mental model for this roughly was like you can have a permissioned remix like you did and that can like go on spotify or you can do or like apple music or whatever or you can do a permissionless remix anyone can do whatever the heck they want as long as they, they have the files and then you can put that on soundcloud mm -hmm. is that yeah roughly right? so yeah, there's there's some nuance there, but I'll, I'll it is like actually a, a very fair question, and I sometimes forget that it isn't like super common knowledge. But basically, the way remixes work, uh, it really hasn't changed. But basically, uh, I I have always chosen to do permissioned remixes if you want if we want to use those terms, right? And and there's a lot of reasons for that. Which one is first of all, you get high quality files directly from the band. That's like first and foremost, like having the full broken out stems, like, and to, to be able to ask for like dry vocals and like things like that, that other people just don't have, like, it's just, it's good. Yeah. Uh, the other side of it is like, uh, they're hiring you, you know what I mean? Like they're, they're paying you to do this and you're getting feedback directly from the artists on like what they like, what they don't. So it's, uh, it's a much more, um, direct thing. Now, the other side of it is that because I'm doing it officially, you know, through them, I'm benefiting from their marketing power and mm -hmm. they're kind of, I, I call it like cross pollination of audiences. So it's, right. it's like when I get tagged in a song on another artist platform, all of those users start to get fed my songs, my other songs. So it, it's a very effective, like marketing thing for me, even just from that perspective. Yeah. So the permissionless version of this, um, and, and yes, yeah, so uh, so, so those songs, yes, can go on Spotify or what, whatever they can, they can go wherever, it, it, but it's usually the artist and their label that put it out. Mm -hmm. So I'm not like involved in the actual like release of the, the remix per se. Mm -hmm. Um, and the payment for that can be anywhere from cash to equity in the song to a combination of things, you know, th there's a whole way to like tackle that. Right. But so the permissionless version is like you you sometimes can get high quality files sometimes um uh obviously you're not really getting direct support from the artist um and there's no real dialogue there so, so sometimes it's cool for something like pretty quick but um you know the you're kind of built you know you're kind of relying on your own distribution basically to be able to get out in the world and even then you can't really monetize it um because you know the label will come after you for right. using it technically illegally i mean there's there's some you know like if you upload it to youtube and soundcloud it's kind of what you're saying like nobody's really gonna you know like make you take it down it's just like you know it's fine and sometimes a lot of artists embrace that it's not like this it's not like a negative thing but i'm uh there's some nuance into how like the we call them bootleg stuff or right. like uh, bootleg remixes work versus, um, you know, the official stuff. Truthfully, for me, it was always just like 
it had really more to do with the audio quality and just be able to get like actual session files like from from the artist that because that really gives you the most flexibility and I, and I think that gave me almost like a competitive advantage early on because um you know I, I was doing I I just had access to a different level of, of files to, to be able to like do what I want um so does that kind of answer the question of like how remixes yeah. work? Yeah. No, definitely. And uh, it's just, it seems non-trivial to get the, it's sort of like, you know, being able to self-publish a book versus like having to get a publisher. Uh, it seems non-trivial to sort of like get over that, you know, barrier. And to your point, some art, I think it's totally valid and reasonable for some artists to totally embrace people doing like bootlegs on their songs. Cause it's just like, well, do what you want with it. Like love that you love it and, and go for it. And some of it's going to be crap and some of it's going to be great and, and that's fine. And mm -hmm. then I could totally see another artist being like, I want zero bootlegs. Like this is the version. And like, if we want a remix, we will get a remix, but like, we're going to choose that artist carefully. Like, so I think both sides are very reasonable. And in crypto, you know, it might be a little bit harder to control that, but you can certainly sort of verify that. Like the artist can easily verify this is an approved remix and it can be permissionless to start, but mm -hmm. then they could go and say, we like that one, you know, that's permission or not that that's permission, but that's sort of like verified and they can like sort of on chain, you know, make it like an attestation basically to say like, mm. that's the case. So there's a lot of interesting things in crypto, but it, it's good to kind of understand a little bit better how it works in the, in the traditional world. Yeah, no, it, it's, it's, uh, there's a lot of layers to it that I, I are actually more social. If you, if you think about it that way, whereas like, you know, an, an artist, okay. Like if an artist sees a bootleg remix on YouTube or whatever, um, I mean, very rarely will they like, you know, try to take it down, whatever, but you know, they're not going to like post about it. They're not going to, you know, or, or maybe they really like it and they do post it. But like, for the most part, like the, the way you sort of verify it is almost like a social verification right. because you're like posting it on your social media or your official account, you know, that gives it that sort of legitimacy. And yes, there's sort of like a, an on-chain, like, you know, kind of version of this, uh, I, I'll say like just in terms of like permissionless remixing and and things like that, I, I I'm I'm personally all for it. I think it'd be very cool. Like I, I love remix competitions and and things like that. It's cool to see people like just be creative with something. Um, but like they're uh, how should I put it? Like uh, they're not always uh, you know it's 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 more of like a there's not a super uh on-chain easy way to verify that that it's the same that is based off the same song so it's like it's almost like a social reinforcement in a way um i i don't know if i'm making sense but it's kind of like uh it, it's it, it, there, it's there's like elements formal it's like soft it's, not it, like it's, a... A, it's a soft thing you know um and like i think there's like versions of this that are very technical and there's versions that are a little bit more like just embracing yeah the kind of informal side of it if that makes sense yeah no it makes total sense um so that's i think a good context for you know it's a very specific part of the music world but the sort of remix world um but now coming back to sort of like 2016 17 you're starting to you put a little money in bitcoin you're having these sort of like ambitious dreams for what could be done with music on Ethereum, even though it's like brand new and no one really is thinking about, you know, no, no one's just really thinking about like these 10 year visions. I mean, obviously people, certain people are, but um, certainly not like specifically with music or like mm -hmm. people are thinking of it more financial, um, things like that. And you immediately come to it with like this music perspective. What were the actual like first, you know, step or two experiment or two that you sort of ran in like, what can we do here? Like to your point, it, it wasn't really ready yet. Um, and you can argue it's, it's still almost not ready in, in certain contexts, yeah, yeah. but, but um, it certainly, you know, it was expensive and clunky and, and all of these things and the infrastructure wasn't built out in a lot of ways, but you wanted to sort of test the waters on this. Like what were the first couple of things that you did? Yeah. So, um, well, you know, I'm coming into it no like real programming experience. Like I was tech technical, you know, but not like, you know, I, I can't, definitely couldn't write Solidity or anything like that. So like I, I reached out to a couple of companies that I, I just did some research and tried to find whoever, 
and uh, it led me to Ujo Music. And Ujo Music is was part of Consensus. Um, and uh, actually, my co-founder uh, with with Oscillator is was also there at that company. Um, and uh, Jack Spallone. So that that uh, actually company was like crazy because the amount of like talent that was like on that team, like Carl Flor, like the f- founder of Optimism was on the team. Mm. Uh, uh, Simon de la, Ru- de la Rouvier, which, you know, he invented bonding curves or like the on-chain version of it. Um, and, you know, people that worked on the ERC-20 spec. And like, it was just like this crazy, like little moment, especially in hindsight, where it's like, like almost like historic. <laughs> and purely <laughs> like, music focused. Y- yeah. And, and, and they were, um, th- they were focused on music in, in almost like a different way. They were, but it was very much like, like under wraps, you know, it was like, they're just building technology, um, mm. you know, contracts that split uh, royalties, like things like that. They were just like focused on that. And this is early days of Ethereum. So like everybody was just like just throwing everything at the wall, seeing what stuck, you know? Um, so we decided to do a project, which is to basically release my album at the time, my 2017 album called Ego. And we decided to release that uh, on Ethereum basically. And, uh, we were, te- you know, we technically claim like we're the first album on Ethereum, <laughs> but like we were essentially, it's just like a smart contract. It was so like simple, you know, where you deposit X amount of ETH. There was like a Oracle that pulled the US dollar value, but it's, you know, roughly $10 of ETH mm-hmm. and, and it would spit back, uh, like a, a zip file and that's, mm-hmm. that's kind of it. <laughs> and it was like so simple. Um, but we, we later, uh, it's kind of funny because this all predates NFTs, but we basically issued like a collectible for anybody that had that bought it, you know, received this thing called the ego token. So again, ERC twenty, but really was like meant to be like a collectible. And it's kind of funny because now those are sought after and like people collect them. Uh, the ego tokens, which is ironic because it's literally just like a proof of purchase, you know, kind of thing. Like it's not. <laughs> It's just funny how people like gravitate towards things like that, like after the fact, you know, right. but, um, so that was like the first experiment. And that was like, you know, I, I'll, I'll never forget. I was, I was on tour in Japan and, um, I was, uh, they really latched onto this. Cause I think like Bitcoin was like much more happening over there. And I remember having like a translator with me because I was doing interviews and whatever. And they were, um, you know, trying to like explain Ethereum to a Japanese translator to then translate it to like, it was like, it was kind of funny. Cause like by the, by the end of like the eight hour session or whatever, they had already like, they were like, I got this, like, I'll explain okay. it. Um, <laughs> but they were very interested in this idea, you know, um, it, it, it kind of made sense. Uh, so, you know, that uh, we did that, project and and then you know ico boom came and like blew everything out of the water and that became the focus nobody cared about you know <laughs> infrastructure or like you know stuff that wasn't financial in nature um so it, it wasn't really till like 2019 2020 where um i started uh me jack and uh, jacob from zora like they were just starting zora and we ended up doing uh, this thing called the tape token, which was basically like a physical cassette limited to a hundred bit on a bonding curve essentially. And this was like Zora V1, you know, this is before they pivoted to NFTs or, you know, what they've become now. Um, so, you know, we, we, uh, we did that and that was, uh, it was kind of funny because like technically uh, we kind of claim we had the most expensive cassette tape of all time. <laughs> Because at one point in time, with people speculating, I think the price got up to like thirteen grand for one cassette, which is, you know, obviously insane. <laughs> but you know, you probably, it, you probably beat the second, uh, you know, highest price pretty pretty comfortably there. Yeah, I think the highest price before was like four grand, um, and it was for Lincoln Park. Fun, funny enough, which huh. I've since like worked with, and and we kind of had a laugh about it. I was like kind of giving him shit about it. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, um, so uh, we did that. But really, the point of that wasn't even like I actually because it's on a bonding curve. I didn't actually really make much money at all from that because I wasn't selling them; it was people selling to each other, you know. Right. But um, it was interesting because it started a conversation as to 
what like what is the value of music you know what i mean like it it's like if you put music into like an actual market what is what is the value you know how like you know is it 13 grand probably not is it right. 0. 0.00001 cents probably not too so like i always think of it it's it should be on a sliding scale really um or i think we should allow markets it's always been kind of a core belief of mine that i think markets could unlock music in a way that um nobody really can see right now but anyway that was obviously early if you even want to call it an nft experiment it was like it was an experiment that led to um doing my own social token which was really just like a rewards token it was a it was actually more of an onboarding exercise to be honest so it was kind of like how do we get you know to 12 13 years of of history of people doing stuff off chain how do we reward them in a way that brings them on chain and brings them into like a something that is not locked into a platform you know mm -hmm. it's like kind of a, a also something really important to me is like not being beholden to a specific platform because i've had to switch so often you know it's like instagram and then you know or honestly even myspace <laughs> myspace to soundcloud to this to that whatever um you know the, the, it's it's like you build up these audiences for these platforms and then they just like you know they just take them like that so it's kind of I felt like that's at least a good direction to move into and also just like a fun experiment. And, you know, it wasn't like a, it wasn't something we sold. It wasn't like a financial, you know, token or whatever. And, uh, you know, but it, by it being and propagating into people's wallets, people started to trade it and it eventually had like a price and whatever. And like people mm -hmm. kind of got into speculating a little bit, although I've always kind of pushed uh, or tried to dissuade that because like that's, that wasn't the goal for that specific token, you know? Um, mm -hmm. there's plenty of tokens to speculate. I mean, by all means go for it, but like, that's not the one, like, I'm not, that's not the u if utility that I'm trying right. to add to it, you know? Right. And I, and I've always been pretty honest about that. Um, but yet people still like to speculate. So, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, so, so we did that. Um, and by the way, this whole period of time, I'm doing all these projects, with my co-founder, Jack, like it's like, we've, we've been doing all of these things together and, um, you know, we, um, we, we, from there, we started to, we, there, there was always this idea of like, okay, at one point we're going to start a company, you know, we've been doing all these experiments with like very reputable teams. And like, we, we, we have a lot of history in this space. It's like, you know, I feel like maybe now could be the right time to start a company around music and technology and, and whatnot. And, and so it, it took till 2023 to really like finally like pull that trigger. Both of us had babies and it was kind of like, uh, I don't know, <laughs> like, I don't know if starting a company and having a kid at the same time is the best idea, but like, you know, for, for us, it made sense. And, <laughs> and, um, and, you know, that's, that was kind of like the genesis of like, or the culmination, I should say of, of, you know, many, many years of experimentation, um, there was there's one thing I wanted to mention about like you know the role that like other music applications have had sort of in this space um where like and this is something that Jack and I like it was kind of a, a revelation for us you know through the process of like thinking through this whole thing but we we realized that um you know there's sort of like a very long list of companies very well-intentioned companies that have sort of surfaced, tried to innovate, but they're using essentially music as an asset. And what I mean by that is like they're offering playback or they have music, you know, the actual asset of music is like used in it, you know? Um, and unfortunately that is a point of leverage that the incumbent music industry has complete total control over through copyright law. So, we've had many examples of, and I'm talking, I'm not even talking like crypto companies, but like even uh, SoundCloud is basically a victim of this, you right. know, um, of a very robust thriving ecosystem could be essentially like shut, not shut down, but like heavily pushed down uh, because they're dealing with copyrighted works. You know um, you see it even with uh 
like on the film side, you know, with Netflix, like I think, for example, like Netflix, when it first came out, they were using other, you know, it was like other movies that already existed, you know, there's first of a rental, but then you could stream, you know, other, other studios, films and whatever, and people like that. But they realized it's like, well, if we don't control the content, you know, then we're always just going to be at the mercy of these, of, of these rights holders, basically. And that's kind of what, um, you know, that's why they moved into original content. And that's really their focus at this point, just funding their own content. Um, but like the, the music hasn't had that moment because Spotify isn't the one funding music. You know what I mean? They're not the ones that are funding the creation of music because it's not scalable. So, they they're always going to be beholden essentially to those rights holders. And the whole point I'm really just trying to make is that uh, and when, when I say incumbents, I mean like the three major labels, they basically kind of run everything, control everything, have full control over the supply. Uh, I think they control like 80% of like popular music, people that mm. music that gets listened to. So it's like a very powerful industry. Um, and we just felt like there, there's so many platforms, well-intentioned platforms that as soon as they touch music and as soon as they're offering playback, as soon as they're doing that, they're just, uh, they're not um, like they're, they're, they're sort of playing into the incumbent industry and they have no like leverage basically. Right. So where, where we kind of landed and where we re really wanted to focus was uh, on the artist to fan relationship. Cause that's like what we've been working on. You know, that's what we've, we've been working on, on onboarding people and dealing with how hard that is and, you know, magic links and wallets and trying to explain, you know, how to <laughs> like, we've been dealing with this for a very long time. And, uh, you know, it, it, uh, it, it was, uh, you know, th that was always like kind of our angle. So it's like, well, let's, let's focus on that problem, artist to fan relationships, because if you really think about it, music is sort of a function of that relationship that it's like the artist to fan relationship is, is sort of the top layer. If you think about it and everything else, all the tickets, all the monetization, all of everything else is sort of secondary. Um, so we decided to just like, okay, well, we can focus on that and we can focus on the data in between those two elements, if you want to think about it that way. So if we focus on that, nobody can stop us. You know, there's no incumbent industry, you know, that could ever stop us from, from focusing on that, you know, and we, they can sort of become like almost like secondary to what we're doing or down, down the downstream from, from what we're trying to do. So that was kind of a revelation for us. And that was like, after years of just like hitting our head against the wall of like, you know, trying to work with catalog and work with the assets and, and all that. Um, so yeah, that, that has, that has led us to like kind of where we're at, which is basically focused on, on, uh, on sort of data sharing amongst, you know, music applications. And, Obviously, right now, focus more on the Web3 angle. Um, and there's a couple, uh, this is all going to sound a little bit vague when I kind of kind of say it, but like basically, uh, there's, there's sort of like, we're thinking about it uh, like a protocol. So like a, a data sharing protocol with multiple applications building on it and like a sort of a, sh a shared like social graph. Like that's like a core element of what we're trying to do. However... Uh, the sequencing of how to get to that is tricky because you can't just start from that and expect people to like join. I think there needs to be sort of a spark or a first kind of social graph, call it that, that uh, that needs to kind of stand up and be worthwhile for other people to build on it. And that has led us through many experiments to really the flagship product that we're building, which is called Factory, factory.fm. And it's uh, the simplest way that I, I explain it is uh, if you've ever used Letterboxd or Goodreads, it's basically that, but for music. Um, and there's there's a lot of reasons for that. First of all, it doesn't exist and it should. So that's like an obvious one. But it's also because like, uh, especially as an artist, and you know, this is very real for me, it's there's not really a great place to solely talk about music you know it's like very fragmented it's very scattered you know um you know if you want to talk about a song maybe you go to the youtube comments under a music video for example but not every song is a music video or whatever and that's also youtube you know it's it's not the greatest music experience um and you know there there's uh there's like a you know maybe reddit 
uh, subreddits or something like that. Maybe pe- like people have like a, an intense fan base that gravitate towards that. Uh, but it's not really that consistent and it's not really uh, very user friendly. And, and I think we just felt like we could build a product that would really uh, be tailored towards like a, uh, like a, a true music fan, like somebody that's really like very into music, you know, not really for casual listeners, but for people that want to talk about music and want to like dissect it and talk about it on a more intellectual level. Like, I think that's, we wanted to foster like a community for that because we feel like that's really lacking. And yeah. the, uh, the upside of that is that, um, you know, we, we can sort of a, a enable a, a connection with the artists there too. So you're getting very high signal fandom, you know, like intentional fandom. We, we talk about this, this idea of, of adding friction to applications can actually lead to a, a more rewarding experience. And I feel like that's maybe like a trend that we're headed to where, you know, it's, I don't, we're not trying to build an app that just, you know, listens to every song or lists every song you've ever listened to. You know, we want it to be like a conscious thing that you actively go to the app, search for the album, write, write a blurb about it and why it's meaningful to you, a memory that it, you know, takes you to something like that. That's like where, um, you know, that, like, I feel like that has led to like a more rewarding experience for those people, even if it's technically lower in number, mm-hmm. it's less people, but it's more high signal. So if we're creating that kind of environment and that's what we're trying to do, create an environment like that, I think, you know, having that connection with, with the artist there makes a lot more sense than sort of a general, you know, um, spray and pray kind of social media interaction that most people have these days. Uh, so I feel like I'm throwing a lot out there, but basically like this is, this is, uh, hopefully people can hear the thread of like trying to over time connect with an audience and bring them together in a way that the artists can control and, and benefit from it. And I think everybody benefits from that. So, um, there's a lot of layers to factory we can get into it, but I, I didn't want to just like talk the whole time. Yeah, no, I. I think, uh, I mean, first of all, it's super helpful, just general overview and and diving into a bunch of specifics as well. But I think um, if I can sort of like summarize why it makes a lot of sense what you're doing from my perspective, um, you, you know, you mentioned these other people, you know, founders trying to make companies in, in music, whether it's crypto or otherwise, and um, they all have this sort of fatal dependency on uh, you know, the music rights where they could just get sort of, you know, the the ground pulled out from underneath them as crypto people call rugged, uh, you know, <laughs> sort, of, sort of like any time. Um, and you saw this with people building apps that were sort of dependent on like Facebook and then Facebook goes and pulls the rug out. And so this is like sort of a common thing across any industry with big, powerful players that you're dependent upon. So going in a direction that doesn't have that sort of fatal dependency makes a ton of sense. And then secondarily, just sort of, sort of happens, whether it's sort of by intuition or otherwise, that you had been hyper-focused on something that did not involve that dependency for a few or several years, which was that, you know, artist-to-fan relationship. And so you sort of built that, you know, you know a lot of what works, a lot of what doesn't work over years of experience. And then you sort of put that all together and it's like, wait, we can build something that actually doesn't have this fatal flaw and that leverages the experience that we've gained and like the wisdom we've gained over several years and it just sort of makes perfect sense that way uh whereas coming at it from just at face value it's like wait there's a music app that's like not about listening to the music like that doesn't really like why like why would i you know that doesn't make it sounds counterintuitive right yeah Yeah, exactly but maybe that's why it hasn't been done um and to your point it's like you look at you know for people who aren't familiar with goodreads or letterboxd it's basically, you know, Goodreads is where people who like to read books talk about books and, you know, review books and stuff like that. And Letterboxd is the same for movies. And I can't think of one good reason why that wouldn't exist for music. I mean, it just... And you wouldn't, you don't watch movies in Letterboxd. You don't read books in Goodreads. Like it's, uh, it's, it's kind of honestly surprising that there hasn't been an attempt at this, at least that we know of. But, um, but, but again, it's just like, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a, I, I like uh, I like to work on stuff where there's uh, there's sort of an obvious need for it and um, and it's it's sort of a there's always kind of a point of friction or like oh I wish this existed you know 
Um, and those are, I feel like some of the ideas that, that end up working is like when you try to solve something that you've personally dealt with, you know, not, not just trying to, um, solve maybe a technical thing that you don't even know if people want to be solved, you know? <laughs> right. And, yeah. and I, I was going to say like, like, um, you know, I, I think sometimes the, the latter happens in crypto a lot where it's like a technical solution looking for a problem, you know, when usually a lot of the stuff that works is the other way around, you know, um, not always the case, obviously, but yeah. Yeah. I mean, you look at like big, some of the big successful companies that come out and oftentimes it's as much a sort of social technology or realization as it is something actually technical, like Airbnb didn't really do anything substantial in the technical realm. They just sort of flew in the face of the stigma that who would want to stay in someone else's house or let other people stay in their house and built a you know platform for that where all the technology had probably been there for several years already and sort of broke that social, you know, stigma or whatever and, and made a massive whatever it is, hundred million dollar company. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the market cap is these days, but it's it's pretty darn big. A hundred million, I meant hundred billion actually. Uh, yeah, I was gonna say like I that. I think it's a little bigger than that. I don't know. Yeah, it's like probably <laughs> probably in the ten to a hundred billion dollar range. Don't quote me on that, but yeah, yeah. something something like that. Uh so anyway, big company. Uh and uh I think uh yeah just to make things a little bit clear because we've been talking a bit about these concepts, but I don't think we've actually laid it out super clearly for those who aren't familiar. So Oscillator is the company that you guys started yes. that is sort of intending to build this, you know, more broader infrastructural um, decentralized music protocol or social mm -hmm. graph, so to speak, um, where people can sort of build on top of it and, and people can take their followers or their fans from one app or their friends from one app and their music listening history or music reviewing history from one app and port it over to another app and it's all interoperable and composable which is like one of these you know huge unlocks that people have been waiting to see sort of activated in crypto for a long time mm -hmm. it's been obviously it happens here and there but it's like i think most people who are into crypto agree that like there's so much more that can happen and, and that can be done um and well, then i, I was going to compare go. you know to you know DeFi, obviously like the uh, composability there is it's it's relatively straightforward because you're talking about assets, you know, like currencies, you know, right. if you will, uh, tokens. That's that's fairly straightforward. Like being able, uh, you know, once I showed some of my friends back in the day, you know, it's like, okay, connect on Compound or connect on Ave or go to Curve or whatever MakerDAO, um, you know, and and they're seeing like their same their assets recontextualized depending on which app you're connected to. Um, you know, I think that was, that's like kind of what we would love to see for data. You know, yeah. we want data to be composable too. And in our context, music, right. but it really could be generalized. So, um, so yes, to, to explain, I thought that's a good explanation of it. So there's oscillator the company, and that is like something we're, we're, we're trying to build. Yeah. Like a protocol. Um, but you know, again, you can't just build that from scratch. Like you have to, we, th we talk about it almost like we have to earn that right to be able to do that. So what we want to do is we want to build uh, a few apps right now focused on factory, obviously, as our flagship app. But we've built another app. We've built this app called Poke, which basically is what it sounds like. It's a, you pick your top eight artists, and then it matches you with other forecasts or lens users that have similar taste. So kind of kind of a dating app, not really, but like <laughs> just like a fun, like social little experiment kind of thing. Um, but, but again, like we, we want to sort of then create that, make that data portable into factory, for example, like just mm -hmm. prove the use case, you know, but again, like we're right now we're focused more on factory. Cause I feel like that has, um, ha has like enormous potential. And then, you know, once we have that up and running and, you know, a, a good user base, that's like when, you know, I feel like at that point in time, we have earned the right to build build out the protocol and and build all all of that other underlying infrastructure. And and at least at that point, we'll ha also have learned a lot about like what you know how to how to do that. So um, that that's kind of our our approach. It's it's kind of like a it's it's two things that we really want to see in the world, and it's just a matter of sequencing them and figuring out how to get to, from from one to another. Um, but yeah, that's that's kind of it. <laughs> 
Yeah. And so I think, uh, you know, for people who are listening, who are interested, like factory.fm is the website for the app that we're talking about, the letterbox for movies, Goodreads for books, factory for music. And then uh, oscillator is osc.wtf, which is more of like sort of where you'll find like the manifesto and like sort of the broader, um, you know, vision for everything. Um, one question I had was, uh, you know, you mentioned like the poke app, for example, you, you used like the social uh graph from farcaster and or lens um i've been on farcaster for like at least a couple of years at this point so very like sort of familiar and, and sort of deeply involved um lens i experimented with like very early and it just sort of like didn't stick for me for whatever reason so i don't really know all of what's going on over there but sort of the obvious question that that sticks out to me is like why do we need and i'm not i'm not asking this as if it's like a rhetorical no or something like that but like I'm trying to understand a little bit better. I, I sort of have some ideas, but why we need a music social graph that is separate and different, or at least, you know, on top of or related to, but like substantially differentiated from these more generalized social graphs that I think a Farcaster or I'm pretty sure a Lens are, you know, trying to build. Yeah. So the, the way we're actually approaching this is, is not meant to be sort of exclusionary, you know, um, in fact, like I think we'd embrace any, you know, using the Farcaster social graph as well as lens and, 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 you know, what we might do behind the scenes is create sort of a apparent identity that sort of merges those two, you know, but it's mm -hmm. not meant to be like, uh, uh, some of these terms sometimes are a little loaded when I say social graph, it's not like we're, we're, like we're, we're trying to use our, you know, we're, we're trying to focus on like our product, right? But we also want to like again to like open that up, like like for example, like if if we just use Farcaster, for example, um, we kind of be limiting ourselves to people that don't have that, you know? Yeah. Uh, and and I think we just kind of want to uh, be welcoming to any, any anybody that wants to join, and including Farcaster and Lens users, you know what I mean? Like, in fact, like if they do that, it's actually would make our lives a lot easier in terms of, you know, some of the crypto element features, you know, down the line or whatever we want to add like curation games, like a lot of that infrastructure is already there. So with that said, but like, we don't want that to be a blocker for getting, you know, a, a iOS user that just wants to log a few albums and talk about it. You know what I mean? Like, right. I, I, it's, I don't want to exclude them. That's it's kind also of a, a de dependency in a different way where, yeah. you know, these Farcaster and Lens, like I, I love Farcaster. I couldn't imagine like it. I think a, a great sign of like a great product is when the users like could not imagine or would be like really upset if it just disappeared the next day. Mm -hmm. And there's like not that many apps that I feel that way. Like honestly, even like, you know, HBO Max or something, which like I, <laughs> you know, I watch a good number of movies and shows. Like if that disappeared, I'd be like, well, you know, there's Netflix and, you know, whatever. But, <laughs> there's other uh, options, yeah. Exactly. With Farcaster, it's like, I mean, obviously there's Twitter, but like, I really like Farcaster for like in different ways than Twitter. Like I'd be really upset if it disappeared it's tomorrow. Different. But at the same time, like these are early companies. They've both, I think Lens and Farcaster have been around for like, I don't know, on the order of like three years. And, you know, you know, they're, they're by no means are they sure things. I think the most probable outcome, like I think it's pretty improbable that both would be enormously successful. Like the most probable outcome is probably that one of them is or or neither of them are just being realistic. Mm -hmm. Um, and maybe, you know, that doesn't mean that they'll die. Like hopefully both of them will be at least as big as they are now, if not bigger and that, and maybe like one of them gets huge and steady state, the other one or whatever, but it's just, you know, you're trying to do your own thing. You've got your own expertise in this area. I think it makes a ton of sense to not sort of gate your experience, your app to, or, or your protocol eventually to people who are on one of these like very crypto focused, you know, crypto native focused sort of apps. I, I think the, the, it's really just like, we want to welcome anybody that wants to use the app, you know, and, and like, this is sort of, I think just a general direction for like the way we're trying to build this app. Like it, it, we, we just want to sort of abstract a lot of that complexity uh, away from the user. Um, and I, I think we'll obviously surface, uh, you know, elements of it if, if there's a desire for that. Um, but you know, I, I definitely don't want to be in your face about that, that kind of stuff. And, but like to, to your, to your point about like Farcaster lens being big or small or whatever, I, I, I kind of like I, my opinions have changed a little bit over the years about this and like, you know, I mean, obviously there's like sort of a, a comparison with 
an obvious comparison with Twitter and Farcaster because it's you know text based, whatever, or me, some minor media things like that. But uh, you know, I I think that the, it's perfectly okay to have a niche corner of the internet. You know what I mean? Like I feel like we've been conditioned that the only success is if it's winner takes all. And I don't know. I I feel like I've been like more into the idea of smaller communities online um because like i mean if you post something on twitter that's you know even slightly controversial i mean you're gonna get hit from every angle you know what i mean and maybe there's like stuff that you would want to talk about in a radiohead forum or whatever that maybe would be appreciated by those people instead of being argued against you know by like just the general public so i don't know there's there's some layers to it that i think are interesting um I I I find Farcaster very interesting in the sense that a lot of the more high higher level discourse around Ethereum has moved there, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think all that's left on Twitter is more of the like pump token, <laughs> you know, buy buy my NFT kind of crowd. Um, they haven't really moved over there because it's not really working. <laughs> but uh, Lens is interesting because it's like I feel like they've they've focused more especially as of late uh, on the um artistic side of things so they have more of like a creative community over there it's very different than farcaster you know it's like mm. it's actually not that much overlap um even though you think so, there would be but i i think that's a cool thing you know i guess that's kind of what i'm getting at is like uh it's like I think it's a totally fair question. It's like, why build another social graph? It's like, we're not really thinking about it that way. It's really just more like, at most, like an aggregator, if you want to think about it that way. And then still being able to surface that data to, you know, um, other applications, you know. Um, I that That's kind of how we're thinking about it, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, totally. And um, yeah, I think what I was saying earlier about like, you know, most probable outcome, like one of these win... I meant like, you know, that big, huge, like sort of Twitter outcome or something like that. And that's why I sort of wanted to clarify, like not to say that the other one dies, like the other one could be totally great for a very Mm -hmm. long time with just a smaller group of people. And I do think, you know, you look at like social media today is probably like the best predictor of what could come in sort of like Web3 or whatever. And it's like, well, there's not just one social network. There's Facebook, there's Twitter, there's Instagram, there's Snapchat, whatever. But there's not like, a hundred that are like super popular either. There's like, mm-hmm. you know, there's, it's a long tail. There's only so many. Yeah, yeah. Niche ones. yeah. So it's like, you know, we'll see what happens, but I think um, to have one for, for music certainly could make some sense. And also if you guys end up being sort of like more of this aggregator thing that also could make good sense. And it's great that you have obviously all, all the sort of like requisite things you need for building factory.fm, but also an oscillator more broadly, but also, you've been on, you know, Lens and Farcaster for a while. So you sort of like get what's going on there. And it just seems like you, and I don't even know like sort of the specialties of the rest of the team and everything, but it seems like you guys have sort of the right mix of of what you would need to to be successful in this space. So definitely, uh, you know, I got my my beta code for the invite for the <laughs> app and I'll, I'll be playing around and uh, yeah, just looking forward to see what comes with all of it. But I, I know we're, uh, you know, substantially over on time. Uh, mm-hmm. If there's anything else you want to, you know, mention, feel free to do so. And if not, I do have, you know, one last question. Um, so I guess that question, you know, feel free to talk about whatever you want to talk about after this. But uh, the question would be actually totally off script from all of this, but I'm just curious, like you've been, you know, creating, you've been like a prolific artist for so long. Like you say, you've been, you've done more remixes than maybe anyone in the world and also <laughs> creating all this original music and everything like that. What's like a, you know, if, if a story comes to mind of like the creation of a, of a particular, you know, song or, or something like that, like one that, you know, stands out not to say it's like the best story ever that you've ever had, but I'm just curious, like to sort of get a window into like the creative process for, for you. Yeah, it's, uh, it, it, it the creative process is interesting. It, uh, everybody's obviously going to have their own version of it. Um, I found that what works for me is, is kind of like a, uh, like a almost strictly improvisational approach where, it's more about editing or it's more about um, almost like curating your own creativity, if that makes sense. So what I mean by that is like, I am going to, I'll sit down for 10 minutes and write a little melody or play, put some drums on it, whatever, maybe longer, like half an hour. Um, 
and you know I'll, I'll sit with it for a second it's like is this working or not no move on you know what i mean it's like not being precious about anything because like you do that 10 times you'll get like one good idea hmm. but if you don't do the 10 times you know if you don't do it 10 times you're not going to get the one so it's like it's this practice of of always getting things flowing always getting things moving um that leads to better songs i think sometimes people have this like idea that or that every single thing you do is is like <laughs> is, is a winner and that is just not true at all uh it's more about not putting out the bad stuff <laughs> than it is putting out the the good stuff um there's a, obviously elements of timing and luck and, and all the other things, but like, you know, all of my favorite songs and some of my most successful songs came very quickly uh, within hours, you know, it was not like this arduous month long process of like hammering in something, you know, it's just, it's not how creativity works for me. Um, so it, it's uh, <laughs> like, I, uh, I, I just like doing a lot of small things very quickly and then, you know, I'll build on it if it if it has potential. If not, I'll 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 I'll, I'll move on pretty quick. And uh, th you know that that's kind of what works for me, I guess. Um, but to you were you were saying about like you know kind of like the last uh, like what would I add maybe to like what we we're talking about? Uh, we've kind of adopted this approach a little bit with with Factory um, within limits. Obviously, it's software development. It's not as quick as <laughs> just like uh you know playing a synthesizer or something like that but we've been pretty uh nimble and loose with the features and we've from day one you know just like we're literally having like one-on-ones with with our users just like hey what do you think about this uh would you use it this way or like how do you you know and we're getting like kind of amazing feedback we even have people that are like drawing up their own figma files for us and hmm. and like suggesting features and it's like I couldn't ask for like a more engaged kind of like, you know, group of let's call them beta testers. Um, and it's really helping us. And I, I like that sort of small iterative approach and, you know, as opposed to us, like, you know, going away for a year and coming back with this like monolithic product, like I'd rather build it slowly over or, you know, incrementally over time. So I, I guess maybe that's like an example of me applying what I've learned in music creation that works for me to, uh, you know, to software development, which is quite different. Um, yeah. And even as you have, you know, factory as, as sort of the main focus right now, that might lend you like that approach might lend you to just like sort of launch an app over a weekend. That's like sort of tangential to factory, but very much in the realm of like oscillator. And um, yeah, it like, like you sort of did that with poke. Uh, yeah. I, know, poke, I think spent, it what but... took us like two weeks, maybe, <laughs> you yeah. know, uh, yeah, no, and, I, and I like that approach. It's like, you know, at the end of the day, it still takes months to like find that hit, so to speak, in, in music or app or whatever it might be. But the actual work on the individual hit is like constrained to, you know, a couple of days or a week or a couple of weeks. And it's just doing that reps and reps and reps until you sort of get the big, the big winner. And maybe that, you know, in the music case, that's the one that you put out. And in the app case, that's the one that sort of takes off. Mm -hmm. the, the way that I think about it uh, in the, with music is, is like, there's really no downside to putting out a song. Um, like, like sometimes the concern is, oh, well, it's not, uh, what if it doesn't do well or, you know, whatever. And it's like, I think we're so bombarded with information constantly that nobody's paying attention if a song doesn't do well, you know, yeah. maybe they don't hear it and maybe they don't see it and it just doesn't even cross our radar. Sure. It's not an, a, an amazing outcome, but it's not like this, like horrendous, like bad kind of thing. Um, so like, we feel not precious at all about like just trying stuff and, and, and seeing what we can do. And, um, I, I, I love the team that we've built, you know, still very early, but, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to sort of like, yeah, to continue to build this company into something, you know, um, that, uh, well, I mean, I'm already really proud of it, but you know, that I'll be even more proud of it. 10 years down the line. <laughs> awesome. Well, uh, I really appreciate the time, man. This has been a ton of fun of and uh, really enjoyed the conversation. Where can we send people to, uh, you know, go and dig in? Obviously, factory.fm, I mentioned, osc.wtf. 
don't know if you have any socials or, or anywhere you want to send people, but um, appreciate the um, time again and uh, look forward to keeping in touch. Yeah, if you go to osc.wtf, you'll find all the social links and and reach out, come hang out. We have uh, we we're pretty very hands on and very active with people that want to engage with us on, on this on this app. So like if you're if any of this sounded interesting, uh, come hang. <laughs> and then thank you so much for having me. I'm very happy that we could make this happen. Awesome. Well, uh, thanks again, man, and uh, have a great rest of the day. All right, take care. Bye.